Right, today I'm here with Ken Lanning. I had the opportunity to interview Ken about four years ago now. It's a fantastic interview and it's awesome to have you back. How are you doing today, Ken? Oh, I'm doing pretty good, pretty good. Well, it's good to have you. And you know what, we're just gonna get right into it. We talked about some of these things before and you've mentioned that a lot of your story can't, comes out of confirmation bias. Do you well, wanna go into that? Well, yeah, what, what I came to the realization uh, is we started to talk about this phenomenon that I began to get consulted on starting in the early 1980s, what came to be called, although I didn't really like the term, but the term that's still used by most people is to refer to it as satanic ritual abuse. So we can talk about what that is, but basically with that topic, I began to consult on these cases and be contacted by investigators and prosecutors all over the country and other people who were dealing with this. I had been dealing primarily with the broad issue of victimization of children. This involved that, but in a very unusual kind of a way. And after several years of dealing with it and hearing what was being alleged, I began to realize that a certain amount of this just didn't seem to be happening. And the key for me was the lack of corroborative evidence when there should have been corroborative evidence. Some crimes somebody could allege that, let's say, for example, some child remembers that when they were young and they're now older, that my father tippy-toed in my bedroom and climbed in my bed and touched me in my private parts or whatever, and that's what happened. Well, now you start to investigate it several years later, and you don't find any corroborative evidence, but what evidence would there be? In these cases, what was being alleged, and we can talk more about it, was the kind of thing that was very difficult to do and not leave behind corroborative evidence. And so I began to then go to these various experts, mental health professionals, social workers, the leading professionals in the area of sexual victimization of children that I had come to know through my work and lecturing and going to conferences and so on. And I went to them and told them this dilemma that I was faced with, that these victims were alleging this, but it didn't seem to be happening. And what they all told me was that it was happening. They, why would they make this up? Why would they tell this story? It had to be happening. You just have to learn better. You have to use better techniques. You have to keep doing it. You have to keep investigating and looking and searching and so on and so forth. And I said, okay, but then the years went on and nothing really changed. No matter what I did with different police departments and work with them and investigators, simply the corroborative evidence really wasn't there. So I began to wonder and ask myself some questions that we can talk about that are very key to this issue. And one of them came to involve, it really became the most important question of what most people, I guess a lot of people today call confirmation bias. And so when I looked at this and I said, if what these victims, and some of them were young children, some of them were adults talking about what happened when they were younger, but if it didn't happen, why were they alleging it? If it didn't happen, where did they get the details from? If it didn't happen, why was there a similarity to their stories? And the fourth one, which I didn't think was that important, but I later learned in my opinion, came to be the most important one. If it wasn't happening, why were there so many educated, highly intelligent people who believed that it was? The so-called experts that we frequently rely upon. We're going to go to the experts. What do the experts say? When I went to the experts, they told me it was going on. The first ones I talked to. And I realized it wasn't. And then I came to realize and the way I phrased it in my book, the book I wrote, is that adult human beings tend to believe what they want or need to believe. And the that makes great, sense. Oh, cool and, question, though. Huh? Sure. Was, was there a specific case, you know, without naming names, obviously there's confidences and things like that, that kind of led you down that path? Like, was there a specific case where you're like, I, I'm, I'm looking at this and things don't quite line up for me? Well, I guess the best answer is there really was not a specific case. There were many specific cases. It's, if it was just one case or two cases, I could explain it away. My problem was that after a, a, 
few months or a year or two, I had dealt with dozens and dozens of these cases. And it was the totality of it that made it really problematic because I realized that, you know, a few people could do this and maybe get away with it, not leave any evidence behind. But when you're talking about thousands of people victimizing tens of thousands of victims and leaving no evidence behind, it just didn't make any sense. A few people could get away with it, but not this many. So it was really the cumulative effect of many cases. And a lot of people would look at it and say, well, there's so many cases, and that's why they believed it was going on. But in my opinion, that's why I started to believe maybe it wasn't going on because the cases were too similar. They had certain patterns to them that you see, and I just didn't uh, quite understand what was going on. You've mentioned in another interview that there was a book called Michelle Remembers, and you didn't know if that might have been what started it? Now, the book Michelle Remembers is a book that many people talk about and focus on when they study this topic. And there are people who believe that it was the thing that started it all. The only reason I don't give as much emphasis to this one book is because when I started to do my research about all of this, I learned that these kinds of stories have been going on for thousands of years. <laughs> it's a common thing. It goes back to the witch hunts of the Middle Ages and this idea that people who are doing certain things are in league with the devil and so on and so forth. But Michelle Remembers certainly played a role in the modern and more the, the manifestation or the reporting of this starting in the early 1980s. I think the book came out in 79 or 80. And it was written by a Dr. Posner, who is now deceased. And he was a psychiatrist uh, from Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, he was a very devout Roman Catholic. I'm a Roman Catholic myself. And he began to work with a student uh, that came to him at a university. I think she was about 19 years of age at the time. And her name was Michelle. And she began to tell him this story of her victimization. And it was kind of the standard story that I learned about of so-called satanic ritual abuse, supposedly happening to her when she was about four years of age or most of it. And he recorded all this information and analyzed it and wrote this book, Michelle Remembers. What is really interesting about it is that eventually he wound up divorcing his wife and leaving his wife and children and marrying Michelle. Ooh. They became husband and wife. And I listened to him one time with Michelle for about eight hours at a conference I went to and listened to this story and I read the book and so on. And there was nothing there that really convinced me and overwhelmed my skepticism about a lot of these allegations. What I didn't know is there was a lot of other people had similar concerns. But anyway, uh, about a year ago, a, an individual who remembers this from his early life because he lived up in Vancouver, British Columbia. And so he was in the midst of all this, this kind of socially and hearing about it. He began to research it. And uh, he came and interviewed me. He knew who I was and he did a lengthy interview with me. And he recently put together a movie that was just shown at the um, South by Southwest Film Festival in Austin, Texas. Got oh, rave, wow. rave reviews and he's showing it around the country. And the name of the documentary is Satan Wants You. And it's about, <laughs> and he tells the story and he gives a lot of weight to the influence that Dr. Pazda had on people about this kind of issue. I think that gay, what gave Dr. Pazda a lot of uh, importance in the whole evolution of this was the fact that he was a very brilliant man. He was a psychiatrist, very well-spoken, very articulate. The other interesting thing about him is that he was skeptical about most of the cases that were being alleged, but he was absolutely convinced that the one involving Michelle was a valid one. And he talked about how to differentiate between the valid cases and the exaggerations and distortions and so on. But when you listen to him, he's a very intelligent, powerful kind of man, very reasonable, seems to be intelligent, the kind of person that can convince people, particularly, as I discovered, a lot of people are vulnerable because as I started to say before, 
adult human beings tend to believe what they want or need to believe. And the greater the need, the greater the tendency. So people who wanted to believe this, and we can talk about the different reasons why that was, who wanted to believe this could be influenced certainly by somebody as brilliant as Dr. Pazda. That's true. Um, Have you ever met with or spoken to Elizabeth Loftus about these subjects? Yes. Dr. Loftus, uh, these cases vary, and I'll just go back a little bit and tell you about the the four types of cases that I encountered. One type of case that got a lot of publicity at the beginning were the so-called daycare cases. And the Mm -hmm. most famous example was the McMartin daycare case in south of Los Angeles in Manhattan Beach, California. And so several of these cases involved daycare centers where you had children who were three, four, five, six years of age who were starting to make these kinds of allegations. And I'll tell you what they were here in a second. The second type of case was what's called the adult survivor. And these were adults, primarily women, but some men, who recovered previously repressed memories of this happening to them when they were very young children. And that's where Dr. Loftus comes into this whole issue of what is a repressed memory? How is the repressed memory recovered? Uh, Is the brain like a video camera that records all this stuff? And if you just think hard enough, you can remember it all. And it's a very accurate recall. So she was an expert on the brain and memory and all that kind of stuff. So she played a role, especially in the cases involving adult survivors. Another case that they just did a documentary about uh, about a year ago was the documentary was called Children of the Underground. And the third category of case were individuals where a man and a woman would sometimes they were married, usually married, sometimes not married, but they had a child together. And then the one spouse, usually the wife, but sometimes the husband, accused the other spouse of being a bad person and shouldn't have access to the child anymore, shouldn't be able to visit the child anymore. And not only was he a bad person, he was so bad that he molested the child. And if that wasn't bad enough, being a child molester, he was also a Satanist. So in a lot of these cases, they started to allege that the person in this custody visitation dispute, the other spouse, and they would go into family court and argue about this, So a lot of the cases rose from that. And then a woman by the name of Faye Yeager, who kind of ran a lot of this underground, they would take these parents who couldn't get the courts to believe them because they didn't have enough evidence, and she would hide them in the underground. And the fourth type of case was what I call isolated neighborhood extended family cases, where a bunch of people who lived on this cul-de-sac or lived in this neighborhood or on this mountaintop somewhere, a place or another, or this particularly large extended family, this was something going on within the family. So those were the patterns of cases. They had some variations within them, but the essential story that the victims all told was pretty similar. And and what I had to do is something that a lot of people don't like to do. And if you're doing research and if you're doing training, definitions become extremely important. So reporters would call me up and they'd say, I'm doing a story about these cases. And they'd say, what cases? Well, you know, like these daycare cases. All daycare cases? Well, no, like this like this Martin case. And I said, well, just any daycare case? And I realized they didn't even know what they were doing a story on. They were just these cases, these weird cases. But mm-hmm. what do you call them? And the word that started to be used most often, as I said, was satanic ritual abuse. I never liked the term, but that's what they were being called. But I realized that if I was going to look at these cases and study study these cases, I had to know what they were. Which cases am I going to include in this group? Which cases am I going to exclude from this group? So I realized that the four important characteristics that these cases had was, number one, multiple offenders. The victims all allege that this wasn't one person who did this. Sometimes it wasn't even just two people. It was a large number of people, five, 10, 20, 100. And these individuals, this group of individuals, were members of some kind of a group. And because the fourth characteristics that I'll come to here in a moment was so strange, 
Many people decided that this group had to be some kind of a satanic cult. Later on, people began to attribute this to various things, organized crime, the mafia, the Illuminati, all kinds of groups. So the first characteristic was a large number of offenders as part of some fairly organized group. The Question second, for you on that. Um, sorry to interrupt, but um, you've had, I, I'd say, the displeasure of interviewing folks like John Wayne Gacy. Yes. Um, you've worked with John Douglas. So you're pretty familiar with deviant, actual people who are have been locked up, right? I, from what I understand, it's extraordinarily rare for deviant people to commit acts um, more than I mean, occasionally two might do it, but three. Am I incorrect in saying that it would be? remarkable for a large group of people to commit deviant acts, judging from your experience that you have extensive. Yeah, the, word, the word I would use is significant because what anybody in law enforcement knows who's an investigator, the more people involved in committing a crime, the greater your chance of solving the crime. The more people you have involved because of human nature. People turn against each other. They, they get in trouble, so they make a deal. They snitch off somebody else. They describe someone else. So the more people, like if one teenage boy goes out and, and is randomly throwing rocks at cars on the highway and so on, it may be difficult for the police to identify that guy. But if six, seven, eight, ten of these teenage boys go out and do it, the chances of solving that case are very high because these kids will just start blabbing and talking about it. So a lot of these individuals operate by themselves or one or two people, something like that. But in here, these structured, organized groups. So it's the totality of what's being alleged. And so the important thing here is that everything that was alleged, I had heard about. It. Matter of fact, the first case that I talk about in my book, the first time I was contacted, the investigators said, have you ever heard of this? And I said, well, I've heard of all these pieces that you're describing. I know of cases where all these individual things happen. I've just never seen a case where it all happened all together. All this happened at one time. So the second aspect of these cases were the victims, depending on how old they were now. Some of them were little kids, relatively young, but had to be verbal. And some of them were adults who were in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, and so on. But they all described the abuse as beginning when they were extremely young. They would sometimes even describe that they remember it began when they were one or two or three years old or something like that. And there's some question like with people like Dr. Loftus arguing as to what, how much people remember from that time in their life. There's a famous case of a mental health professional, I don't know exactly what her background was, who claimed that she had a victim who was an adult survivor who had been molested as an unfertilized egg in her mother's fallopian tube. And so you start to deal with some of that stuff and you start to have some doubts about this. But again, the key factor here is the children, the abuse of the children begins when they're very young. The reason that's also important is there are individuals who are sexually attracted to very young children, but they're relatively small in number. Most individuals who victimize children are victimizing children who are 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years of age, a little bit older. There's not many individuals, but some, and those would be the true people who are, in fact, stimulated by very young children. The third characteristic that these cases had was that they were all described that the primary controlling factor used by the offender to control them was fear. They were frightened. They were told that they were going to die, their parents were going to die, uh, that their pets and the dogs and cats were going to die, and on and on and on. Whereas what we know with many acquaintance offenders, that's offenders who know their victim but may not be related to them, they tend to use grooming and seduction and befriending the child to control and manipulate the child. These were victims who claimed to be frightened, and many of them, as they got into adulthood, would claim that the cult was still tracking them. The cult was still after them and you know, tracking them down and so on and so forth. And the would, would, would fear would fear be used as a tool to keep them in line later? And what uh, what I mean is, could it be that the grooming, um, friendly behavior brings them in 
and then the fear later on is to keep them in line. Is that a possibility? Absolutely. And so the important thing here is to look at each of these things in its totality. And so some of these offenders who groom their victims, sometimes later on to control them. I used to use the analogy of a pipeline. You recruit these kids, you groom them and seduce them, you molest them, and then you pass them out the end of the pipeline. And there's when you're passing them out the end of the pipeline where you're kind of vulnerable when you're finished with these kids and you're not returning their calls. And that's when threats and fear can be used, but not quite to the extent that you had in this case. They would talk about engaging in human sacrifice and drinking blood and so on, which leads us to the fourth characteristic of these cases. Some people call it rituals, bizarre rituals. I know what that is and use it in a different way, so I'm reluctant to use that term. But I would say bizarre behavior, because now we're talking about things that go beyond what most people would even consider to be sexual. When you say someone sexually victimized the child, the thinking of vaginal or vaginal sex, insert, inserting of the penis, uh, certain kinds of touching and things like that. But these individuals would talk about bizarre ceremonies and rituals, drinking blood, smearing feces, urinating on bodies, and on and on, and, and eventually, in many cases, actually sacrificing and murdering the victims. So you had this kind of extreme ritual type behavior. Now, the reason that I didn't like the word ritual is that I've been involved in many, many cases where sex offenders will use rituals, their sexual rituals. In order to become aroused and gratified, they need to engage in activity in a certain kind of way in order them to become aroused and gratified. So what- Like a the, fetish? Well, almost. like a fetish could be, like the presence of that fetish or having that fetish or whatever it is. So there's certain rituals that certain offenders have. And so in my training and what I've done and what we studied in the behavioral science unit, we distinguish between repeated patterns of behavior engaged in because they work, and that's called MO, modus operandi. They commit their crimes in a certain way because it increases the odds they'll get away with it. Or repeated patterns of behavior engaged in because of a need. In order to become aroused and gratified, they need to do it this way. If they can't do it this way, it's hard for them to become aroused. They're aroused by very specific kinds of things. And we call that ritual. And so this ritual that what people were talking about in these cases had nothing to do with that. So people would say to me, have you ever encountered a case of ritual abuse? And I'd say, well, how are you defining the ritual? By the way I define it, I've been involved in many cases. The way people were defining it here, satanic rituals, engaging in certain kinds of things on certain dates and holidays and doing it in a certain way. I had people tell me that Satanists, when they eat their victims, they eat them in a certain sequence and in a certain way. And these are the kind of rituals they engage in. It is those rituals that I could find no evidence of. Now, in addition to the cases that you consulted with, with the FBI, um, again, you went around and you interviewed a lot of locked up people. And did you learn about these rituals or, or, or how they were driven uh, during these interviews? Well, no, we, we, we did a lot of different things. In the behavioral science unit, we did three things that most people are kind of confused by, particularly if they watch too many of these TV programs and movies. We did three things. We started out doing primarily training. We were part of the training division. So we were teaching classes that were accredited by the University of Virginia. We were doing training and education and so on at the academy and traveling around the country and eventually the world doing training. We also did research. We did something that a lot of police officers would like to do, but frequently don't have the time to do it. And that is to study closed cases, to look at cases that you've solved and study them and analyze them. So we did a lot of research. And as part of that research, we went into prisons and interviewed different types of offenders and so on. And the third thing that we did that people don't understand because it really gets distorted, is to engage in case consultation. Now, there's a difference between case consultation and investigation. I was an FBI agent. And so if I was an FBI agent who wanted to do investigation as an FBI agent, there had to be allegations of crimes under the investigative jurisdiction of the FBI. Mm 
I just can't go out and investigate anything I want. And most sexual victimization of children does not involve federal violations, other than certain circumstances, maybe on a military reservation, maybe taking the child across state lines. But most cases of molestation simply aren't violations of federal law. So what we were doing in the Behavioral Science Unit is studying these cases, researching these cases, and consulting on these cases, advising and giving advice. So I consulted on hundreds and hundreds of these types of cases. I didn't personally run out into a helicopter and fly around the country investigating every one of them. I couldn't. Well, that's no fun. Yeah. But the, uh, the cases that I did, the people that we interviewed, I never was able to find someone who would say to me, yeah, I did this. Let me tell you all about it. So we interviewed, we interviewed lots of individuals, me and other people in the unit, who did some terrible things. They were serial killers, child killers, all kinds of things. But none of the people we interviewed described doing the kinds of things that were part of these alleged uh, satanic ritual abuse cases. And that was one of the problems that I had. None of these people ever turned evidence against somebody else, said, no, this is the guy who did it, here's the evidence, this is where we buried the body. What all these people would do is when we couldn't find the corroborative evidence, the people who believed that it was going on would come up with all kinds of elaborate explanations for why we didn't find the evidence, but they could never show you the evidence. So, for example, one of the things that was alleged that these groups, when they did all these things, they were making videos or movies of it. And that was what was commonly referred to back then and even today as snuff films. These are films where you start out with somebody is alive and during the process of making the film, somebody is killed and that's a snuff film. And so they alleged that these groups had these things and you would look and they put them here, they put them there. We would search and look and dig and so on. We never found these films that if you could see it on film where they actually did it, that would be con- pretty convincing evidence. But we searched a home of thousands and thousands of child and found the videos and the films that they made of them children, but not doing the things, those four things that I just described, having an organized group, very young children, this fear is a controlling tactic, and this bizarre ritualistic activity going on. I just couldn't confirm it. And so you just discovered that a lot of this stuff was the stuff of legend. And so when I began to broaden my research and talk to a wider number of people, I began to learn about cases like this that have come up down through the centuries and allegations of this. And in the Middle Ages, they would have cases, and probably the most famous case that people are aware of in the United States took place in the 1600s in Salem, Massachusetts, where these very similar type of allegations were made. And that's why when people say Dr. Pazda started it all, well, he may have started the most recent modern version of this, but it's been going on for a long time and it's ebbs and flows, pops up in different areas, sometimes broader than less. Matter of fact, in the 1970s, there were many cases similar to this, but instead of involving mutilation of children, they involved cattle mutilations. And so it was alleged that these satanic cults were going in and mutilating cattle and doing things. And then every once in a while, I would see a debate between one group of people who were convinced that these cattle mutilations were going on, but it would be ridiculous to suggest it was done by a satanic cult. It was clear it was being done by aliens from outer space. <laughs> and then the other group would say, aliens from outer space, you may be nuts. This is this is satanic cult is doing this and so on. So each was convinced that the other's version of events was kind of ridiculous. Theirs made a certain amount of sense. So I never really was able to corroborate cases in which these key elements could be proven, that there was some evidence of it that you could find. You could find members of the group who turned against each other and reported it. You could find videos, pictures, photographs, and so on and so forth. Other evidence left behind the bodies. And you say, well, whoa, they, how many people are these people kill it? 50,000. That's how many were murdered every year, 50,000 by these satanic cults. And I'd say, well, where are all the bodies? We can't even find them. There's not even enough missing children to account for this. And they'd say, oh, uh, some of the women became breeders. They would 
They would have sex with the members of the cult. They would get pregnant. They would have babies. They wouldn't record their births. And then they would sacrifice these babies. And the reason there's no record of it is they never reported that these children were born. Then they would talk about how they were buried in double-decker graves. They would find a grave, put their body underneath the other body and so on. And then they had one of my favorite things. They had portable crematoriums. And I say, portable crematoriums, what exactly are they? And how big does something have to be? You'd have to have something as big as a Winnebago. People don't realize the temperatures. If you just take a body and throw it on a fire, you have a burned body. You don't have an incinerated body. If you're going to cremate a body, you have to reach very high temperatures for an extended period of time. So you just couldn't find these things. Where are these crematoriums that they're using and so on? And so everybody kept alleging it. And they would just come up with all these explanations. Another one of my favorites, because it personally touched me eventually, is that they would frequently begin to describe that one of the members or more than one of the members of the group was a police officer. Now, I don't know if he actually was a police officer, but he was wearing a police officer's uniform. So then one of the explanations for why the evidence couldn't be found is because the police were part of it. They were involved in it. And eventually, mm. when I began to become more and more confident, and it took me probably three, four years before I was willing to come forward and start to speak out. I was, did not just willy-nilly decide that I was going to allege that victims of sexual abuse weren't really victims of what they were alleging. That's a pretty significant thing to say. It has a lot sure. of significance in many areas. And so when I finally came forward and started to speak out, People decided that I was a Satanist who had infiltrated the FBI to prevent the uncovering of this secret. What if you watch movies, particularly even a recent show that I love, like Blue Bloods, they always talk about feds get involved. The feds always screw it up. You know, this conflict between the feds mm -hmm. and the locals, they don't want to work together. But suddenly I was such a wonderful FBI agent that somehow Ken Lanning all by himself was able to miraculously prevent all police departments from investigating these cases. Well, I'm, I I'm want to bring up a, I don't know if it's a case or what it is, um, but anytime I bring this up and say something about, quote, satanic panic or, or what have you, people push back at me and say, no, it's absolutely true. And it's all been released. It's called the finders. And the FBI has released the documents and it's all there. So I, I just wanted to ask you, because I have not honestly dug into it very deeply. If you're familiar with the name, the finders and what that is actually about or not about. Yes, I'm somewhat familiar with it. And I wish, you know, one of the problems I tell people who are now contacting me in the last year or so contacted me about all of this. I said, if you had contacted me 20 or 30 years ago, it would have been a much more productive interview because so much of this stuff was in the past. I knew this stuff inside out and backwards. I, in, as part of my research, I accumulated every one of these manuals, anybody who had any material, all the satanic calendars, the holidays, the people, looked into all these cases. I networked with all these people. But the finders were a case... And I don't remember all the details of it now because it took place so long ago. But some of these people are involved in Northern Virginia, the Washington, D.C. area. What made it more appealing is that some of them had some ties, apparently, to intelligence information, maybe the CIA or something like that. And supposedly the police executed a search warrant on some building or residence and so on, gathered up all this evidence and had it all, and it's all documented there, but no one can find that evidence today. And I knew people who were in on the search. I personally was not involved in the search. And most of the people have told me that a lot of the stuff that others are alleging was there simply wasn't there. So this was a group of individuals who was involved in some strange behavior, but not to the extent and not that it would explain all these hundreds of cases that I was involved in. And then there was somebody there who felt supposedly that it wasn't properly investigated and he went forward and gave information to somebody. And this becomes, and one of the reasons I'm now retired, 
And as I look at the world around me now as an old retired person, I see so much of this playing out today in today's modern world, but not with allegations necessarily of satanic ritual abuse, although some of them have. This has become part of the modern story as well, allegations of satanic ritual abuse. But a lot of this business of false information, uh, fake news, and all the rest of this kind of stuff, conspiracy theories of who's involved in what, and all these people making allegations. I just read this morning on the internet that apparently somebody in Congress subpoenaed some informant records of the FBI, and the FBI wouldn't turn it over, and this was somehow proof that the FBI was involved in it, and it's covering it all up, and we really have this information and all these big, powerful, high-ranking people are involved in it. Some of the people, the good news for me was that uh, people who accused me of covering this up began to realize that one FBI agent couldn't do that. Even the whole FBI couldn't do that. Maybe it was the Department of Justice. Maybe it was the whole government. And maybe it was Zog, (laughs) Z-O-G, the Zionist occupied government. The whole government is part of this. And various other conspiracy theorists would jump on this and borrow bits and pieces and take a tidbit here and a tidbit there and weave this story together. And now the thing that's different about right now, 2022, 23 versus 1995, 96, when I was dealing with this more directly, is the Internet and social media. This stuff spreads like wildfire all over the Internet. And people believe that this nonsense they read on the internet is accurate information and they pass it on and repeat it and spread it and all these conspiracy theories. And it's very hard to prove the negative. When they were accusing me of being a Satanist, I'd say, well, how do I prove I'm not a Satanist? (laughs) How do you prove the negative? And I used to laugh because I went to Catholic school for 16 years and I had a nun in the sixth and seventh grade, Sister Evelyn, who was convinced that I was going to be a priest. And I said, she would have been horrified to find out instead of becoming a priest, I became a Satanist who was uncovering this mutilation and murder and sacrifice of children and infants and all this ritual abuse that was going on. But in the newer versions of it, that started out with the place underneath the pizza place in in Washington, they had a Mm -hmm. secret tunnel that went to a bookstore and all that stuff. And this was supposedly all run by whoever was your political opponent, Hillary Clinton, the Democrats, the Republicans, somebody, Donald Trump, all these conspiracy theories. You just wind up throwing into the pile all the people that you dislike. Well, to wrap things up, I do want to hear one story or have you share it again, because it it sums everything perfectly. And it's about a show that involves conspiracies <laughs> and aliens and the FBI. And you might have had a little bit of an influence on it. It's called The X-Files. Yes. Matter of fact, I just saw uh, last night there was a program with David Duchovny, who played the guy, the a- FBI agent on The X-Files was being interviewed. But anyway, what happened was, and I can't remember his name, I think it was maybe Cooper or something like that, but the guy who was the creator and originator and producer of the X-Files. Uh, he would have, he, every year they would look for story ideas for the program and so on. And so some retired FBI agents that I knew went out to see him in Los Angeles to talk to him about cases they were involved in and some ideas he could use for the show. Anyway, they returned and they came to me and said to me, Ken, were you ever on the Larry King show? And I said, yeah, I was on the Larry King television show. But the day that I was there, he wasn't there. There was a guest host. And they said, what were you on there talking about? And I said, I was talking about allegations of satanic ritual abuse and what was known, what was unknown, what was being alleged. And I was on there. I wasn't on with her, but an adult survivor came on first. She left. And then a, a psychiatrist and a psychologist came on and I came on and the three of us discussed this hopefully on a more professional level. So he said, okay, you're the one. And I said, what do you mean I'm the one? So we went out and asked this guy who created the X-Files. We said, where did you get the idea for the X-Files? And he said, one night I was watching the Larry King show. 
And this FBI agent came on and he talked about a lot of what I just described to you here about looking into and investigating and researching and studying these allegations of satanic ritual abuse. And I began to imagine that there were phenomenon that were going on or type unusual types of cases that you would study. And therefore they would require specialized knowledge and experience to properly investigate these cases. So he expanded that and broadened it beyond just satanic ritual abuse, all kinds of things with aliens and so on and so forth. Now, I don't have any problem with people who watched and enjoyed the X-Files as escapist fiction, but when people would take a tour of the FBI headquarters, they wanted to know where the office for the X-Files was. They wanted to know where <laughs> the department was, and of course it didn't exist. And, and I just thought it was ironic that my efforts to emphasize objective, neutral, fact-finding analysis wound up with the creation of a program that's exactly the opposite of what I was trying to advocate for, a program that presents a lot of this stuff as if it's happening. But I don't have any problem with the show. And if somebody said I watched it and I enjoyed it, fine. But if you think it's real, that's, that's your issue that you're going to have to deal with. But later on, other programs came on and they would talk about these kinds of cases and they would refer to the Lanning Report, which is a monograph that I wrote in 1992 and so on. But I just thought it was kind of interesting that something that my efforts to try to present this professional objective uh, analysis of what was going on led to a program that presented an almost opposite kind of approach to dealing with this. I have no problem. What I want to emphasize here some people said I was trying to cover it up. I never said to a police department ever who contacted me about these cases, oh, this is a load of nonsense. Throw it in the garbage can. Don't investigate it. What my book is about is the investigator's guide, a previous publication, the investigator's guide to allegations of ritual child abuse. And I talked about how to professionally and objectively investigate the cases, which would include considering alternative explanations. Because I actually believe that many of these people who claim to be victims of satanic ritual abuse were victims of something, just not what they're now alleging. So it's not an all or nothing thing. It doesn't mean that everything happened or nothing happened. A lot of these cases are in between. And one of the things I discovered to answer those questions about where did the details come from? Why is there a similarity to the story? And so on and so forth. A lot of it has to do with contagion and contamination overzealous investigation, leading and suggestive questioning. So we find many explanations for how this spread. People had a lot of this material, material that was shown to the victims and that led and suggested things to them and told the story. But some of these people may in fact have been victims of something, but I don't, I never found any evidence. They were victims of these extreme versions of their victimization that came to be called satanic ritual abuse. Well, this is Perfect. Now, Ken, I would love to have you back, if you don't mind, and speak to you again next time, though, about 1968 to about 1973 and comparing how things are now versus how things were then. And I'm hoping maybe you can join me and share some of your background about bomb investigations and things of that sort, if I can. Well, yeah, I mean, I was in the, I joined the FBI in 1970. So I was more familiar with, from an investigative point of view, the things that happened after 1970. And I actually began my career as an expert in bombing. <laughs> and, right. and that just kind of indirectly led me to getting involved in the behavioral science unit. And then I became a specialist primarily in the area of sexual victimization of children. Well, perfect. So hopefully next time we can talk about that because I think there's a lot of meat on that bone that I would love to go into. Mm -hmm. And um, I really look forward to it. Mm -hmm.